Are you cold? I am. <laughs> well, it might warm up before I go with. I didn't. I didn't have my wife around to tell me to go over last night and turn it on, so I just turned it on this morning. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, still on a little chilly side. <coughs> Now, you'll recall a few weeks ago we dealt with the subject of reconciliation. But I want to try to diagram it for you this morning, the same as we tried to diagram redemption for you. Because I think it is uh, very, very important that we not only know these things by way of uh, our head, but possibly, as we can see things uh, uh, diagrammed for us a little bit, why, maybe this will help us out. Now, there are about three or four uh, major references to reconciliation that we would like to share with you. Now, uh, uh, this is not all of them. Reconciliation is a doctrine that uh, is um, uh, well known and uh, one that uh, has much as far as the Scriptures are concerned. So, we'll put... Uh, We'll put the word on the blackboard, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now then, what does it mean? The meaning of reconciliation. Well, we have uh, uh, dealt with this by way of definition and uh, meaning and uh, uh, irrespective of what may be a dictionary definition, reconciliation simply means to be bringing something into harmony with another. Or there is the harmonious uh, bringing together of two possibly opposing uh, thoughts or two opposing points of view. But basically, it means to bring into harmony, bring together, bring into harmony, and uh, whereby uh, there is uh, a unanimity, that which is uh, uh, not uh, adverse to one standard or one person and so forth. Now then, by virtue of its message, let me give you the uh, major uh, passages if you want to take them down. First of all, Romans 5, Romans 5, 2 Corinthians 5, Ephesians 2, and Colossians 1. Now there are four passages of Scripture, as far as chapters are concerned, that deal with uh, reconciliation, and uh, it uh, gives us a very... Uh, I think, a complete and uh, wide range of understanding of just what reconciliation might mean. Now, I tried to uh, bring out, uh, when I spoke on this, um, an illustration of what reconciliation is not from the standpoint of the Scriptures, but what people consider reconciliation to be. So we'll just simply draw a couple of, of little boxes here. Now, I suppose as far as our life is concerned that uh, the most uh, common way of thinking about reconciliation is the matter of management and labor today. Isn't that right? Uh, we are all engaged in some way in society which involves some type of a uh, discord when it comes to the matter of uh, management and labor when you look around and you see one strike after another. I, I was surprised one day when uh, we drove into town and uh, I noticed that one of the filling stations out here on, uh, what is it, uh, the highway coming out this way, why well, they were on strike there. And you went down a little bit further uh, on uh, 17, and lo and behold, there was a, a another picket line. Uh, they were holding up uh, cards, and um, so I said, well, someone's uh, not uh, too happy here either. 
and then uh, uh, we've been off of the uh, television for ever since the first of the year, and they're not too happy down there. So we've got a lot of unhappiness uh, when it comes to the matter of management and labor. And so we just put down this management and labor. Now, someone said, well, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good illustration as far as the home is concerned. There's discord between management and labor. Now, I don't know which, which one you want to illustrate as far as that's concerned. <laughs> but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, here is a, a, a point of discord. Now then, when it comes to the matter of trying to get these things together, there is uh, the idea of bringing in an arbitrator. And so they'll deal here and try to bring that person that far and come over here. So now, where, where can we get together? Where can we compromise? Where can we give a little, eh? And so they'll get that far. But they, they're not together, are they? Well, so they'll meet together again and come over here a little bit further and... and well, we're getting closer. We're getting closer all the time. And then finally, it's like this. It's just kiss and make up all together there. So they, they, they've given and taken so much that uh, the, here is uh, harmony. The, the management and labor is reconciled together for a little while again. Okay? Now, that is not biblical reconciliation. That is an illustration of reconciliation which goes on today in a, a practical uh, way of our living. Here there's one side that uh, uh, doesn't agree with another side. And so then there is a matter, well, what can we agree on? So they'll try to find uh, a point that they can agree on, and they'll come that close together. But they say, I don't agree with you any longer. And, well, I don't agree with you. And so till finally they can solve their differences and come to the place where, there is, where they are reconciled. But that is not biblical reconciliation at all. Let's look at our Bibles now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want to begin reading with verse 8 of Romans 5. <coughs> <laughs> You'll have to, you'll have to uh, do what I think and not what I say, all right? In Romans chapter 5, we'll begin reading with verse 8. Now, is that a little better? <laughs> all right. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life, and etc. Okay, hold your hand here and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that you have the major consideration of reconciliation. <coughs> Beginning with verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though, God, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Now then, let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Beginning with verse 14. <coughs> for he is our peace who has made one, has made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments uh, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. 
and having come and pe preached peace to you who are far off, and etc. All right, now then, let's go to, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. <coughs> Notice verse 20. Verse 20. Now, here are the four major portions of the Scriptures on reconciliation. Beginning with verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. All right. Now then, here are the four Scripture references which <coughs> will give to us the major thought and major teaching on reconciliation. Now, there are certain things that we need to observe when it comes to the matter of reconciliation, and that is this. Someone needs to be reconciled. Now, who is that someone? Does God need to be reconciled? No. In every one of these passages of Scripture that we read, we do not find where God needs to be reconciled. So we're going to draw a sphere like that. And that's God. But what we do find is we find that something else needs to be reconciled, not God. And so we'll draw a square box, just like a soul. Now, the best way I know how to illustrate that is to show you that there is a great difference between God and that which needs to be reconciled and that happens to be the world. The world. Now, that's a sphere or a round circle, and this is a square, and I'll tell you, the square and the round, of course, I don't know what modern math does, but in my way of thinking, a square doesn't uh, equal a circle. Now then, as I come to the Scriptures, Regarding reconciliation, God is the standard. It is the world filled with man that needs to be reconciled. And I find in every single one of these passages of Scripture that the world made up of man is that which is out of step or that which is out of harmony in every, re in every respect or every regard, eh? So, reconciliation. Now, first of all, I wish I had more board, but I don't. I'll just put a one down here. You can't see it over there, but that's next to God. That one represents the source, the source of reconciliation. That source of reconciliation is heaven, heaven. The hope of reconciliation does not have its source in the world made up of man. And so that's the reason we put that one up here. The source is heaven. Now the problem is number two here. That's the world or man, as you will probably remember. But now, noting that the source of reconciliation is from heaven, the need of reconciliation is man in the world, how then, is the next question, how then is the world reconciled? you got to remember now, reconciliation is bringing into harmony. 
bringing into harmony. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to see what happens, first of all, in reconciliation. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, <clears throat> I read verse 18 and 19, these words. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. All right, now then I am told <coughs> what is reconciled. I am told how it is reconciled. But to illustrate how the world is reconciled to God, I'm going to draw a, a larger circle here. Now, that world needs to be reconciled to God. And I'm told that God was in Christ, this is the how, reconciling the what, the world unto himself. So I'm going to draw the world in there like a that. Now that's the world. The world, I am told, right here in verse 17, has been reconciled. Isn't that right? That world. Therefore, something had to be changed. The world was changed. It was out of step. It was out of harmony. And so, in order for the world to be reconciled with God, it had to be changed. And so that square is changed. It's just got the rough edges knocked off, isn't that right? It's got the corners knocked off so that the square peg, if you please, can fit inside the hole. The world, then, has been. Now get this. Right there. I'm told the world has been been reconciled to God. How was it reconciled? Well, I'm told that God did the reconciling. And the means of reconciliation was by the cross of Jesus Christ by His shed blood and by His body. That's what Colossians chapter 1 tells me. Now then, I want to know really what was the problem. Now this is rather emphatic when you come to Colossians chapter 1 as well as the other passages in Romans 5 and etc. But let's notice there in Colossians chapter 1, we'll just hold her hand in 2 Corinthians 5 and just use Colossians 1. <clears throat> Again, let me read verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth, and you that sometime alien were alienated in enemies. Enemies. And I'm told in your mind, manifested by the walk. Manifested by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. This is one of the most amazing truths that I can find in the Scriptures. To, as far as I know, we call today between countries such as a Cold War, right? There's a Cold War going on. Well, the reason they call it the Cold War is because there isn't bullets being shot. Eh? But now, that's just between certain powers. Since World War II, my gracious, 
There's been lots and lots of wars, isn't that right? Blood has been shed on every continent. And it looks like it's getting ready to be a whole lot more. I don't know what's going to happen down in Central America today. But blood, war, why? Because they're enemies, isn't that right? Now the amazing thing is this, God is an enemy. It's the world and man's the enemy, isn't that right? Yeah. We're the haters of God. The world is mad at God. What for? What did God do? Hmm? Well, let's see what God did do. God created man. First thing he did, as far as man's concerned. Then God put him in a perfect place. Is that God's fault? And what else did God do? God gave him a perfect way of life. God gave him a perfect manner of fellowship. And what did God do? God made him sin, right? Eh? I mean, man said, right? That's right. And Satan moved upon that free will whereby man said, I hate you, God. And from that time on, man has been an end. An end. Hate. Alien. wasn't responsible for any of it. Now then, I do. I have to do something about this. Because the counsel of his own heart and the love of his being to the objects of his creation are yours. And so he took his son, another perfect provision of God, and he sent his son to the place of the battlefield. And they shed his blood. All right? But by the death, of the heart of God's love. That in order to change the enmity, it took the blood and body of his son, Jesus Christ. Still mad at God. Still haters of God. God so loved the end. God so loved the hate. He did. <coughs> and so doing, <coughs> here's my hand still just fighting God. Hater. Take a look out there. Huh? Everyone said, oh, yeah, I love God. I love God. They're still by wicked works showing that they're hated of God. How about you? You hate God this morning? Said, no, I don't hate God. Well, is that right? Then what are you doing? Hmm? What am I doing? It isn't the talk. It's the walk. Then he says, enemies in our mind. I talk, I walk, I thought. Okay. Love God today? Well, you're at him. God is you. God is me. And 
to this wonderful second Corinthians 5. Again, I'm going to read verse 18. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and then he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, you be reconciled to God. <clears throat> day before yesterday. I had Mandy in a little bit on my lap. And uh, Alice said, uh, do you know what Daddy used to do to me? And I was teasing him, playing with him. said, I tried to keep him from biting my finger, and I put it up as close as I could, like that, you know. And I'd pull it back to see if I could... Uh, because I didn't like Daddy biting my finger, but I'd play with him like that, <clears throat> and like that, and I'd growl, <clears throat> like that. And so little bit did that, and uh, she's poor. And she got it back. And so Mandy, <laughs> Mandy, just uh, not quite three yet. She's not quite as quick on the reflexes. And poor little girl, naughty poppy, Right, she said, oh, that ought to be a lot of fun. And so she stuck her little finger out there. And lo and behold, if I didn't bite it. And <laughs> here I was. I, I was holding her in my arms, and I was loving her, and I was playing with her, eh? And I loved her. And I wouldn't hurt the little thing for the world, but lo and behold, a bitter finger. And she had that little finger right in my... Well, as soon as I bit, and I didn't bite too hard, but I bit it. She pulled it out. And I got a rough spot on my tooth. You know, I cut that little thing. I'm going to tell you just about broke my heart. But there was blood on that little... And boy, did she ever let me know. And she talked about it all the rest of the day and all night. Poppy, no bite my finger anymore. Poppy, no bite. Poppy, no bite. Well, <laughs> tears just streamed down her face. Now, I was holding her, and I was loving her, and I told her I did love her. But, prove it to her, huh? Prove it to her. And so, we had to get a Band-Aid and put it on there. But from her point of view, she was hurt. Isn't that right? She was hurt. Well, she was, too. Now, that's not a good illustration because I was the one that did the hurt to her. But God didn't hurt me. God didn't hurt me. I got hurt. My own sin. But there, I was holding that little toad in my arms, telling her I loved her and was kissing her and wiping her tears away and all of that. God 
took away the keys. He took that, paid for that, so that his gracious great arms could hold all of us to his heart caress us, love us, and he didn't hurt us. Satan did. Showered upon us all of his heart. And so he changed the problem for us, and we're there. And then he comes along and says, listen, since I've taken care of the problem, now then, won't you be reconciled to me? I reconciled you. I reconciled you. Now then, every individual in that whole wide world, won't you? Won't you allow yourself? that which I provided for you. Eh? And so we draw this huge circle like that. And this verse says, then verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was shouting from the heavens, as though God did beseech you by we pray you in behalf of Christ, is literally the word. You, you be reconciled to God. Have all of those old rough corners off, and you be perfectly reconciled to God. No more of that enmity at all. Get in the place where there can be peace between your heart and the one who paid it all. Listen, he paid the price of blood. He did everything that he could do. And he so changed you and changed me and placed me within the sphere of reconciliation. Now then, as an individual, world been reconciled. It has been rendered reconcilable. Now then, how about you? As an individual, as a person, would you be reconciled to God? that you might simply trust that Jesus did this for you. He's done the work. Now then, will you let Him? Will you let Him? Love you like He wants to love you? Will you? The 14th verse of the 2nd Corinthians 5. The love of Christ constraineth us. For because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to live what? But unto him which died for them and rose again. The proof of my reconciliation is the practice of my life. That's just exactly what proved the world needed to be reconciled. Enemy, mind, mean you're going to be sinless, but it does mean that you've been brought in the heart. Just as an illustration in closing.
My name is Clock. The old clock was out of tune, out of time, all broken down. <coughs> Mainspring not working right. It was just clattering. The clock was taken to the one who could put it in time to reconcile it to that timepiece which was the perfect master chronometer. <coughs> and so reconciliation looks at this <coughs> twofold wonderful reality. And that is this. My condition changed so that my practice can be changed. And now, a relationship with the one who has brought me into perfect harmony with himself. I may be very imperfect in my practice, but I'll tell you, I've got a perfect, a perfect, absolute perfect condition as far as being perfectly reconciled to God. Why? Because he did it all at the price of blood. It didn't cost me one dime. And since that time, I wouldn't trade you that life of all of my practical imperfections for one second of that life or that life. All of the fling and all of the frill that once used to characterize the guy that now is reconciled to God. What a great, what a great truth for what a great life. And why shouldn't I now want to live? prove what I am when once I proved it so perfectly that I wasn't reconciled. Our Father, we're thankful for your wonderful and glorious grace to be brought into such harmony with such a perfect standard. Our Father, we need so much help today to walk in that way of your provision. You've given us the Bible. You've given us the indwelling Spirit of God. You've made us a new creature in Christ. You've given us the opportunity of a fellowship. You've given us a master teacher, the Spirit of God. You've given us a glorious hope and incentive of being forever with you. You've given us such a wonderful and glorious reality that someday we're going to be separated eternally from this wicked, godless world. Father, you've done it all. And how we praise you. We do pray that throughout these days which are ours by your grace, we might be those that will walk in the practice of your provision. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you.